this is a uh, interesting occasion uh, when jacob uh, said that he's uh, going to come to india and spend some time here uh, we thought that we will discuss uh, his uh, book which has come recently from oxford uh, university press it actually explores the questions in detail about the nature of the debate that exists around secularism and the way in which non western culture tries to deal with it so bharatiya rusi we keep talking about secularism whether we like it or not we have been part of this you know uh, debate on secularism for unwanted reasons and uh, there are different kinds of claims uh, that happens around the issue of secularism i mean just to introduce the context I mean, jacob will tell uh, in detail about the book what i have requested jacob to do is not to really uh, talk about the book i will show you the book you can uh, go through and read it but it he will actually set a context in the way in which one should look at that book i mean because it requires it's an academic book it requires it's very important because whether we are academicians or not the issues like secularism communalism in a whole bunch of discussions we are compelled to encounter it for varieties of reason even if someone does not want to be an intellectual you know things that are happening in india compels us now this book has come out of a, a long uh, journey i mean to set a context for long journey i just wanted to bring it to your attention one newspaper uh, clipping today in vijayawani see in karnataka congress pradesh committee organized a lecture in memory of jawarlal nehru yesterday and uh, one of the intellectuals and a politician b l shankar was supposed to deliver the lecture on jawarlal nehru there and it's a hall with 150 people and there were eight people sitting in the hall and he had to deliver the lecture for eight people now what does it say it's not about the numbers but it tells us something very interesting now see this is a program which was organized by congress as a political party which has a history of 125 years we have seen stalwarts coming out of that party both during the period of uh, nationalist movement and later we have criticism of all of them i mean we have huge problems with all of them and uh, that's a different issue but the point is that it is a political party which has made a huge significant difference in this country for whatever reason good or bad reason and there are only eight politicians sitting and listen, listening to the talk of which two, two three of them had to coordinate the program and there are five audience listening to shankar and they were uninterested in listening to bl shankar what does it tell us it tell us something very deep and significant in the sense that there is a way in which we talk about morality of politics how should politician conduct themselves etc etc but there is a way in which politics happen in this country now this instance actually demonstrate that the talk that we do about how should politics should be how should democracy be has no relationship the way in which we conduct our politics now if it would have been of some significance to do the politics of the kind that we are interested in see a politician need to win the election he has to make the law if there would have been some meaningful discussion about it even the most third rate politician would have come and heard because it is important it would be useful and most of the politicians felt that it is not useful that tells us that the many things that we talk in india we discuss in india have no relevance in the way in which we conduct ourselves so there is this two different world a fictitious world a world which is an imaginary world within which we talk about how it should be how it should ideally look like and there is a way in which we conduct ourselves and we have been doing fairly well for you know one may have disagreements but we have been sustaining ourselves in this manner now this is precisely the question which occurred to professor bal gangadhara way back when he was a marxist he was from bangalore he was a marxist he started finding this as a difficulty in the mid 70s and to explore what is this problem that is creating that is being created in his daily life he went to belgium he wanted to really study marx he wanted to study european philosophers and understand them because he had this doubt it is possible that indians would have misguided him so he went and he then he got married to uh, a belgian uh, lady uh, he started living with europeans and then he started looking at the question of cultures the cultures differ 
and it's very difficult to make sense of the difference which emanates out of the culture. Now, he asked this question, see, there are any number of differences. See, two individuals differ with each other. There could be biological difference, there are psychological differences, there are sociological differences, there are differences which emanates out of jati, any number of differences that you can talk about. Now, he raises this question, what makes a particular difference into cultural difference? And for his surprise, he discovers in the early 80s that this question has not even been asked. Everyone seemed to be talking about cultural difference, but it doesn't seem to be an idea that one needs to think about, you know, seriously go about. He goes and searches everywhere, anthropology, sociology, political science, philosophy, everywhere. He couldn't find an answer. And that becomes his major work. And he writes a grand proposal of how to think about these issues way back in 1984. Now, 30 years down the line, people like me who are trying to follow some of his theories, are still struggling to understand what he has written way back in 1984. I mean, it's a grand project. Of the subset of that grand project, he produces his work called Heathen in His Blindness, which actually gives us a clear-cut idea about how, when Europeans came to different parts of the world, colonized non-Western cultures, how did they experience this world? In fact, he makes this interesting proposition in the sense that see, when European people had come, when they lived here, when they talked about these cultures, that is precisely how they experienced. And the way in which they experienced comes out of their culture. And then, is it true or false? And Balu takes a very interesting kind of position there, and he shows that it is precisely how they experienced. So in the experiential world of Europeans, that is true but it has nothing to do with the way in which we live and conduct ourselves. So there is this disjunction between the way in which Europeans have talked about India, described India, and built theories about what Vedas are, whether Vedas are sacred texts, whether you know Gita is the text of Hinduism, whether Hinduism oppressive or not, whether Hinduism and Buddhism are different religions, whether it has to be called different religions or not. I mean, is it a conglomeration of religion? All kind of things we keep still, you know, keep talking about without understanding what are we discussing. I mean, these questions make a lot of sense to Europeans when they ask this question. For Indians, we don't comprehend these questions. And when we say this, out of our research now, we, with a small group which is aligned to uh, an international network of uh, students under the leadership of Balu, when we say this to people, we see actually resistance. Because, oh, don't we understand religion? Oh, we, we know, you know, like uh, there was Jesus Christ, so we have Shankaracharya, and you know, we have doctrines here. Uh, is Tathomasi not a doctrine? You know, these kind of conversations, you know, uh, uh, crop up. And to go and tell and explain, they say, look, you don't understand the notion of doctrine. You don't understand the idea of religion. It becomes extremely complicated, and it's an academic uh, uh, endeavor. But the challenge in front of us, people like me who live in India, is that we need to do two kinds of tasks simultaneously. Now, all these issues, see, look, in last six months, the number of issues that we have dealt with, Shabrimalai case, Shani Shidnapura case, then Rohit Vemula case, then JNU issue, any number of issues we come, there are two completely divided opinions. It doesn't look like we are talking to each other. I am telling my story, you are telling your story. Both of them does not understand. We See, for example, when Kanaya Kumar's issue, many people got up in support of Kanaya Kumar and saying it's a threat to academic freedom. So it, it does not even occur to us, how does uh, agitation being intervened by police become the question of academic freedom. So that very clearly exemplifies that we don't understand what academic freedom is all about. In that sense, there are a large number of problems like communalism, fascism, I mean, any number about caste oppression, caste discrimination. So any number of problems, we have principled positions. We wanted to take a position this way or that way, and we wanted to say we are the one, there are one group of people who wanted to claim that we are the great civilization, we have solved all the problems. There is another group which wants to say, no, India is notoriously bad, I mean, it is an oppressive country, the human, human dignity doesn't exist there. In between these two conversations, the challenge in front of us is that we need to find out what is that phenomena? Why is that people are talking about? What is the kind of discussion that we should conduct? You know, while doing that, there are two levels of players here. There are a set of scholars who had to do fundamental research, ask questions about the phenomena that exists in the social world, 
and talk about human experiences and it's an entirely different job and there are a set of people who are confronting see there are political activists there are social activists there are different kind of people whether they like it or not they have to respond to these issues and today in 21st century india we have enormous opportunity to make response you know there are print media there are visual media and there are social media all sorts of media in this sense we are compelled to create this link between the academic scholars who engage with serious questions about what constitutes the experience of indians what is the nature of indian culture and what kind of problem that we have when we are actually imbibing the western ideas with us and second is we need to find out a way of dealing with this younger generation activists who are interested in participating in this democratic public discussion so in that background secular debate on secularism is very fundamental any number of issues that you take it goes and latches on to this problem of secularism everyone talks about the secular state secularism i am the true secularist you are the pseudo secularist all kind of claims do exist people talk about some complex phenomena called secularization i mean most of them we don't understand what are we really referring to so jacob's work jacob has been the student of professor balgangadhara for 15 years now now as he was a phd student he did his postdoc with professor balu and now his faculty he teaches something called india studies program and jacob's work actually tells us you know practically he looked at the foundations of secularism the way in which europe understood it and the way in which indians and non western cultures looked at it india as a case study gives us an understanding is that see this anti europe rhetoric days are over now there is a time there are enough number of challenges in front of us that we have to learn from europeans and europeans had to learn from us so this idea of we being informant is also over it is the time for us to sit and talk together solve the problem because the world has become so complicated today that without knowing some of the most foundational work in the europe we can't make sense of the constitution we can't make sense of the state we can't make sense of any other things to give you an understanding if you look at the series of judgment which comes not from the ordinary judgment but the constitutional bench of the supreme court about what is essentially religious if you read a series of judgment you would know how bankrupt our judges are any european would laugh at it that is that that gives you an idea of the bankruptcy not because that the person who is a judge is not an intelligent person it's just that you know these cultural ideas we do not have access to it is not part of our experiential world now how do we make sense of it how do we engage with such question are the challenges in front of us now jacob's book is actually the most of the work that he has done has been published in uh, top class journals in different parts of the world and they have been collected reworked and they were published as a part of the book and i would now request jacob to sort of sketch an outline of that book in a manner that all of us can go back and try to understand what are the central concerns of the book and by reading that how do we make use of some of these ideas and how do we learn from it to deal and address our own day to day problem because whether we like it or not we are subsumed in in, in these problems see because there are days where people are happily going and doing mad snana or any other ritual but today you can't because there is any number of intellectuals who would say it is good or bad and the newspapers carries this debate for months and months whether this ritual should be allowed or not and whether it is secular ritual or not i mean all kinds of nonsense questions appear now to understand this and to make an entry and to think about and and retain our culture and learn from it and give it to others teach them there is something that we india can give to people in the world and we have to learn from europe in that process jacob's book stands out a very unique uh, book and now i want him to talk about it without me spending much time on it thank you let me begin by telling you a story i mean the story starts in europe in italy sun is shining i suppose it shines most of the time in italy and there's this lady called soile lauzi she's of finnish descent finnish origin she married an italian moved to italy and she has two sons she's also a member of the italian association of atheists she sends her two sons to a public school and the two sons come home and tell her that there's a crucifix 
on the wall in that public school, in the classroom. So a crucifix, a cross, symbol of Jesus Christ, she thinks at least. So she is quite shocked. She probably knew about this, but now that her children are going to school there, and she's an atheist, she's not too happy with this. So what does she think? She says this is a violation of secularism. This is a public school, a state school. So a crucifix on the wall is a violation of the principles of the secular state. Why? Well, in secular state, religion should not be present in the public sphere, especially in state education. Children should not be indoctrinated or should not, no religion should be imposed upon them. So what does she do? She's Finnish, so you take it to the court. Tremendous trust in the law. She goes to a local administrative court, challenging that crucifixes should not be there on the walls of this school. And that her sons are, her, their freedom of religion is being violated and secularism is being violated. Now the judges of that court come up with some very interesting reasoning. See, they say, the crucifix is a symbol, but it can have many different meanings as a symbol. To some people, it might be a religious symbol, as in it might refer to Jesus Christ, death on the cross, his resurrection, the fact that he died for our sins, and that we have to have faith in him. To other people, it might just be a trinket. Uh, for someone who doesn't know Christianity, you see that symbol. It just looks like two pieces of wood. But for the Italian state and public schools, they say, this is not a religious symbol, it's a cultural symbol. Why? Well, see, the con constitution is secular and the state is secular. And there are principles of religious freedom, equality of uh, all people ir irrespective of religion, um, some other principles uh, in the law, but they say these come from Christianity. It's not as though they're unrelated to Christianity. In fact, the core of our secular constitution corresponds to the core of Christianity, and this is the framework in which all Italians live together. So the crucifix there is a symbol of our shared values and the fact that they have this uh, old age origin. Now, Soili Lautzi is not happy. She says, uh, they're ridiculous. Uh, they could, this, this is a secular school. It's supposed to be secular, and a cross is a religious symbol to her. So she goes to the Council of State, the highest administrative court, and appeals to the decision. Council of State develops more or less the same argument as his regional court, and they agree this is not an active religious symbol. It's not as though it indoctrinates. By putting a cross there, it's not as though the symbol imposes upon us that we have to believe in Jesus Christ as the savior of humankind. It's a passive symbol, and even there, it's not clearly a religious symbol. It symbolizes our common values, and it doesn't exclude anyone. So, Soile Lautzi is not happy. And there's one more court she can go to the European Court for Human Rights. So as she appeals there, a European Court for Human Rights, the first chamber, I mean, it has several chambers, the first chamber deals with this, and there happen to be some, well, secularist judges, let's say. So what do they say? It's very clear, crucifix is a religious symbol of Christianity, it's not a cultural symbol, not a trinket. It's a religious symbol, and it violates the secular character of public education. So the crucifix has to go from the walls of public schools in Italy. So Ile Lauzi was happy, you can imagine. The Italians weren't, because it was their tradition, their history, to have these crucifixes, and they felt that People moving to Italy should know this is historically a Christian country. Many of our values come from Christianity. So this is a framework in which we live together. 
many other Catholic and Christian countries in Europe, especially in the Eastern and Central Europe, countries like Poland, uh, um, there must be several more, but some of these countries, uh, neighboring Poland, very unhappy. Because if this happens in Italy, it's a European level court, it has to happen in their countries, and I'm sure there's someone there of the atheist association who'd take it to the European court. So they file a common peti petition saying, again, this is not an active symbol, it doesn't impose anything to us, to these countries, it is just a symbol of the transcendental origin, so of our values. I mean, the values in some sense come from God, so you cannot do this. It goes to the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights, and there's some wise judges there. So they say, first of all, we don't have to judge whether the crucifix is a violation of secularism, because there's no principles of secularism in the Convention of Human Rights that's there among the European Union states. It's not even mentioned. We just have to check whether it's a violation of the principles on freedom of religion, equality of uh, all citizens irrespective of religion, and they say it's not a clear violation there because it's not imposing any religion on the people who see the crucifix, I mean, in simple terms. And they add something very interesting. Say a margin of appreciation should be left to the different EU member states because depending on their respective history and past, they will have problems with the crucifix and say that it's a religious symbol which should now go, on, go as is the case in Belgium, for instance. That fight was fought uh, uh, many decades ago and the crucifix cannot be there in uh, public schools. But there are many, many countries with a very different history, so the courts at the level of those nation states and the governments have a margin within which they can decide according to a kind of consensus that lives in society about what is religious intrusion into the public sphere, what is not. Well, why did I tell this story? At first sight, it has nothing to do with India. It's a European matter. But not if you look closely at it. See, the first thing is, one of the typical principles of secularism is that religion should not intrude into the public sphere. That can mean many things. It can mean, for instance, in Belgium, it means more and more that public servants, state servants cannot wear, say, a headscarf. You cannot wear a cross visibly. It also means that there should be no reference to God or to any religion in laws or in uh, courts of law. It means that our state laws cannot assume the truth of any religion. So it, there's all these things. What does the case show? That it's very difficult to decide whether or not something is religious. Where it's the crucifix, which seems obvious to Soile Lautzi, it's not obvious to many people that it's a religious symbol and certainly not in all contexts. I mean, just imagine some village in Karnataka, there's a person there, a Hindu, for whatever that classification is worth, but he's not Christian, not Muslim, not Jewish, not Parsi, so a Hindu. He sees the cross, and he knows the stories about Jesus Christ. He says, see, the cross is a symbol of the Swami. When we see that, we know it refers to this particular teacher, spiritual teacher that Jesus Christ was, you see, they tell this story about him dying on the cross and then getting resurrected. Well, we have met, had many people here. He went into deep samadhi and then seemed dead and then came to life again. We've had a chap in the, the other village, a sadhu. He'd been meditating for a long time. Then he asked us to bury him, and three days later he stood up again. So it must be like that. He was an enlightened man, and this cross is just a symbol of one more enlightened man the way different enlightened men can use certain symbols. So he doesn't see it as a religious symbol at all. And this is not a fictional example. In fact, this is what happened when many anthropologists began to tell 
uh, or, or Europeans in general be began to tell the story of Christianity, this was a common reaction. Oh, yeah, we also had someone like that here. In the Roman Empire, ancient Romans saw Jesus reacted, oh, he must have been a very good magician. So it's not obvious at all that this is a religious symbol. And that goes for many things. And how do you decide whether a headscarf is religious? In France, they wanted to ban beards for Muslim students in schools and, and for teachers and public servants. So the question was, how do you recognize a religious beard? So the thing is, I was going to use Chaitra's beard as an example, but he shaved it off. <laughs> so you just have to use Chaitra's imaginary beard. So, yeah, I mean, let's take Sandeep's beard. It's less <laughs> impressive. It's less impressive, but okay. So, or do you know Sanjay Subramaniam? This academic, he has a very long beard. How do you decide where it's a religious beard? Uh, on, in terms of the motives? Uh, Sandeep, what's your motive, uh, religious motive for growing your beard? Or, or is it a secular motive? Well, I'm being lazy. <laughs> That's one answer. Now, it doesn't work. So what do you do? You forbid it for Muslims. But that's very clearly discrimination on the basis of religion. Because you just say, if Sandeep were, had another name, like Mustafa or something, then he could not wear this beard teaching in a public school. Doesn't work. It can prevent everyone from having a beard, but that goes against basic freedoms in a democracy. So what do you have to do then? You have to say, a beard of a particular shape and length is a religious symbol. So you have to imagine Sandeep goes to bed tonight and his beard keeps growing throughout the night, you know. He gets up and his beard has become a religious symbol suddenly. <laughs> See, these are, I mean, it seems funny. It is funny in a way, but these are typical problems confronted when we have to apply the principles of secularism. So that's the first thing you see. Second thing, very interestingly, what did the Italian judges say? They say all the principles, legal articles, related to the secular character of the Constitution, in fact, correspond to the core of Christianity. They even call it the hard core of Christianity. They say secularism in Italy came into being under certain con conditions, and those were Christian conditions. So it's a Christian secularism. Now, they're right. They're absolutely right. If you look at the history or, or just the background of most of these ideas, say religious freedom, you cannot understand the idea of religious freedom without Christianity in the background. As, as uh, Balu's niece's grandmother once reacted, she told her about religious freedom. She said, what's the big deal? She didn't understand why this was important because yeah, people can do whatever they want. You can do puja to, uh, in your tradition, you can follow whatever you want. So why does it even make sense to speak of religious freedom? Well, in Christianity it does, and it has a ver very particular specific meaning. It doesn't just mean that um, you're free to do anything you like and then call it religion. No, there's been centuries of debates about this, but when something becomes a religious act or religious practice, which should be free from state interference. And those debates, if you look at them, do go back to Protestant and Catholic Christianity, and very often the conflicts between Protestantism and Catholicism. So the question, what is religious, what is secular, was a very important question to them, because to them it meant when a practice was religious, that me meant it's one of the duties or the obligations we have towards God. And God is not just any God to them. It's the creator of the universe who's created humanity to obey him. And only if we live up to his expectations, not live up to, say, uh, only if we follow his commandments, and, and worship him in the proper way, only then can we even hope of finding salvation in the next life. So to them it's not a joke, because when something is religious 
and the state prevents you from participating in that practice, it means the state is condemning you to eternal damnation. You'll go to hell because of state interference. So their religious freedom becomes incredibly important. You can, the state cannot prevent us from doing these things because otherwise it's betraying God, violating uh, the, the commandments of God. So that's one of the reasons why the distinction between the religious and the secular was incredibly important to them, why there were so many debates about where the state could enter and where it couldn't enter. They said religion, I mean the Protestants said, religion is basically the domain where only God can interfere. And no human being can tell another human being, this is how you should worship God, this is how you should have faith in God. And certainly not the state. So that's another thing these Italian judges pointed out to us, which is again very important because Indian judges have been debating what is religious and secular for many decades now, and we'll come to the kind of debate they've been having. Now what else is there? Well, secularism is Christian in an even deeper sense, well not deeper, first in a, a harmless sense or less harmful sense, say, why can't you work on Sundays in Belgium? Or why should you be free not to work on Sundays? Because the seventh day God rested, according to the Bible. So this is not a secular law at all. It very clearly has Christian origins. But then there's a much deeper sense in which is very importantly Christian secularism. How did this debate start between Protestants and Catholics, and between Christians, and there was another group in Europe, the Jews. Now, one of the things that the Protestants kept pointing out is, Catholics violate the principles of religious freedom and the secular state because they think that the papacy, the priests, the Pope and his priests, have authority both in the secular and in the religious realm. So you should obey the Pope, and should, even if the state, the state, the country in which you're living, tells you to do something else, you should obey the Pope. So there was this tremendous fear among Protestants that the Catholics in the country would betray the nation state because they had loyalty to um, the Roman Catholic Church. And they also followed all kinds of practices that were very manifest in the public sphere. While Protestants more and more started saying, Religion is an internal matter, it's between you and your God, and it should not be imposed anywhere in the public sphere. And it's each believer has his own personal relationship. So they had tremendous problems with the Catholics, which went on until way into the 1960s, at least in America. So Catholics between in Protestant countries for a very long time could not hold uh, state jobs because they were not trusted. They didn't have certain rights and they were seen as basic violators of freedom of religion itself. Because what did the Protestants say? Actually, it's not religion at all. It's a political institution which acts as though it's religious, this Catholic Church. So problems with the Catholics. They also had problems with the Jews, and especially in Germany, when secular nation states start developing. They have tremendous problems with the Jews because they say the Jews have this religion of ceremonies that keeps them separate from the entire nation as a separate nation with a separate religion, separate practices, which also separate them in the public sphere. While in the public sphere, irrespective of religion, we should all be one nation consisting of citizens whose religion becomes irrelevant there. So they begin to see the Jewish community as a problem. And that develops. In Germany, we all know what it led to, and in other parts of Europe. So secularism did have tremendous problems with certain kinds of religion, in this case, Catholicism and Judaism. That's another way in which it was Christian, because these were basically Protestant criticisms of the Catholics and the Jews. Now there's one more thing that I'd like to point out to you. The entire sequence of events does show that there's a reasonableness there. 
see, all these people were debating with each other and could understand each other. They might disagree, Soili Lauzi disagreed vehemently with both the Italian judges and with the final judgment of the European Court of Human Rights. She said, this is clearly a violation of secularism, this is a religious symbol. Well, the judges understood what she meant by that, more or less, and could explain why it's not a religious symbol in this case, but a cultural symbol. The European court judges included this principle of margin of appreciation, which is, again, very reasonable. What do they do? They say there is a consensus in a particular society as to what is religion, when religion intrudes in a harmful way into the public sphere. So we have to take that into account. And this principle allows them to do that. So in a way, they come to very reasonable judgments. Now, this is where we leave Europe. The sun was still shining. We come to India, the sun is also shining. It's not Bangalore today. We're in Delhi, probably in the summer. It's extremely hot. This is 1948-1949, and the Constituent Assembly is meeting in Delhi, chaired by Bimrao Ambedkar. And there's a debate about the Uniform Civil Code. They want, some people want the Uniform Civil Code as a part of the Constitution of India. Other people say, no, we shouldn't do that. We should have a directive. So there's disagreement. There's a Muslim representative who says, look, India is going to be a secular state. That means the state cannot interfere in religion, and there's religious freedom. According to us, Sharia is religious. It comes straight from God. He's from Allah. He's revealed himself. If we do not follow Sharia, we're not obeying God, so then you're taking our religion and our way of life away from us. So a st secular state cannot have a uniform civil code. It has to allow Muslims to follow the Sharia, this man says. Seems very reasonable. In Europe at the time, they would say, what is this? I mean, secular state means precisely that you have uniform laws for people of all religions, and they're individual citizens there. But still, it is a reasonable point. Uh, what is the reaction by um, several people, including Ambedkar? See, when we say a secular state and the state should not interfere in religion, we mean what is essentially religious in a religion. Religions also have many other practices which are actually secular, if you look at it, like the management of Religious institutions is not a religious practice, it's secular. So Ambedkar says we should define religion in a narrow manner and only include what is essentially religious in these matters. So people can do a puja, but managing of temples, that's where the state can interfere, say, for instance. If certain human rights are violated, then the state can interfere, according to these things. Of course, when you don't know what is religious, and we saw that in the case of religious symbol, it's very difficult, even in Europe. In India, this entire language is completely alien, so it's much more difficult here to say what is religious about, say, the practices that some of you follow. Ambedkar has a solution. He says it's essentially religious. Now, if you don't know what is religious, you cannot know what is essentially religious. So you're trapped. Still, this gets into the Constitution, which says that religious freedom goes only for the truly religious practices, but there are other secular practices which do not fall under the scope of this freedom. So you have these um, legal cases in the Supreme Court. Let me just take one. There's this court where two Jains were challenging uh, an act in Bombay about the management of temples and land of temples and the fact that the state government could interfere there. So the judge knows Indian constitution, says, well, actually, this is not a violation of your freedom of religion or of the secular character of the state because it's not essentially religious. So they ask him, what is essentially religious? Well, 
it means the relationship between you and your creator. So whatever binds a man to his creator, that is what is essentially religious. Now this is an etymology and definition that comes from one of the church fathers, Lactantius, who explained the term religio in Latin as that which binds us to God. Now Cicero, Cicero, the Roman pagan philosopher, gave a completely different etymology, so it shows you how Christian this is. He said it means to select carefully what is transmitted from generation to generation. Now, judge gets into trouble because these are two Janes. What does their lawyer say? Janes don't believe in a creator, so this distinction cannot apply to them. A well, judge is in trouble. But he has something else in his bag of concepts. He says, instead of creator, we'll use conscience. So whatever binds a man to his conscience, that is what is essentially religious. So therefore, this does not violate your religious freedom. There's something very strange here. Imagine you have Virendra Hegde managing the temple in Dharmastala. So you say, whatever you do, it doesn't matter. It's not a matter of conscience. Conscience here means morality. It's According, in, in the Christian terms, it means that which tells you what God wants from you to do. And in a vague English usage, it means the voice within you which tells you what is good and bad to do. Now imagine there's some corrupt Swamiji who begins to embezzle money from the temple to build a big villa and buy a BMW. So apparently, according to his judge, that's not related to the conscience at all. It's a secular issue, so no problems. See, it shows you, as Chaitra very rightly said, these judges are not fools. They're highly educated people who seem to know English very fluently, who've read the laws, who probably read jurisprudence from Europe, uh, parts of constitutions elsewhere. But when it comes to applying these laws, they get into all kinds of trouble and seem to be talking nonsense. Compare that to judges in Europe. They also sometimes say foolish things. We all do, I suppose, and in all groups of people, you find people who say foolish things. But what is clear when they have these debates about whether or not the crucifix is a violation of religious freedom, this refers to their experiential world. I mean, these have been debates that have been going on for centuries about what it means for a state to be secular, what is a religious practice, when it's not religious but secular. So this refers not only to their past but also to their everyday world where they see a cross, a crucifix, and some people will think of Jesus Christ, other people will think this is imposing a religion on me, yet others will have a different reaction. So there is a shared background framework on which they can rely to then also come to reasonable solutions, like this margin of appreciation. Now, as Indian judges, that's missing completely. So it depends on an individual judge who's read the constituent assembly debates or vaguely knows about them, who takes this statement from Ambedkar and some other Congress leaders and comes up then with ad hoc solutions like the next judge would borrow a definition of religion from an, the Australian Supreme Court. Next judge would have, I mean, there is once a six, uh, in the Bomai case, there was this a bench that gave different definitions. And the six had seen that it's not wise to do so because it came across as really silly that everyone gave a very different this definition. So he said, secularism is a very complex notion, therefore it is best left undefined. Okay, so how then are we going to interpret these legal articles? What are we going to do when someone says, no, no, this is a essentially religious practice? Now, in 1970s in Delhi, things got worse in the Supreme Court because this 
doctrine developed among Supreme Court judges, especially a judge called Gajendra Gadkar, the doctrine of essential practices. So what did that mean? Up until then, judges had at some point began to say, what is religious or secular, what is essentially religious, we let religions decide. So we have to refer to the religions. Now in Christian communities, that was somewhat solvable. They could take the Bible and, or a priest could come speak for the community, a bishop could come and say, look, this is what we consider essentially religious. Among Muslims, there might be disagreements among different communities, but within a community, there would be some kind of agreement. Trouble starts when you come to Hinduism. So you have all these traditions. If you ask someone in the tradition what is essentially religious, everyone will come up with some different answer. It's not like there's some religious authority who can speak for the entire community. And when some pujari goes and tells the Supreme Court, that is our essentially religious practice, many people in that group might say, no, it's not essential to me at all. <laughs> so what do you do? Uh, you cannot refer to the Bible. You cannot say, in the Gita it says what is essentially religion. The Gita doesn't say that anywhere. So there, they were already in trouble. But Supreme Court judges are very helpful people. So they said, we will decide for you. Don't worry. We'll solve your problem. We've said first that you have to find out what is essentially religious. You cannot. So we will solve the problem. We're very generous with all our intellectual abilities. So we'll find out. So they said, we will look at scriptures. But then this Gajendra Gatkar found in these scriptures some descriptions of practices that he thought were superstitious. So he said, actually, even in the scriptures, we find these things that have been added later. He calls them accretions. They've been added by people like the Brahmin priests, and those people have added that, and it's actually not essentially religious, so let's get rid of it. So the Supreme Court judges begin to reform Hinduism and see it as their task. Again, this seems a bit crazy. Even the Pope doesn't have that kind of authority to just remove practices as it suits him. I mean, there'd be huge debates among the cardinals and councils and so on, and perhaps then they can stop a certain practice, but not like the Supreme Court judges do it. So what's happened here? I, Chaitra has pointed out something very important. There's a kind of gap between these people's experience. I'm sure many of them con continued to do pujas of some kind, uh, had in their own languages they would speak very differently. I mean, the Indian uh, local languages that they used. But then in the Supreme Court bench using English, they would, as though it's very clear to them, say, no, this is essentially religious, this is not, this is an accretion to the core, pure core of our religion, ask them to say all that in Kannada or in Tamil or in, even in Hindi, they get into trouble. They have to come up with some translation that Nehru once came up with. Secularism means dharma nirapekshita. He's cutting off dharma. So dharma is also ethics, law. What, what do you mean? You have to cut the state away from ethics, is it? So doesn't work. Now let me if you take the story I told you about Europe, we all know where English comes from. It comes from this rather insignificant island somewhere north of Belgium. We all know where these ideas of secular state and religious freedom, etc., come from, from Europe. So in India, who first introduced them? British colonials. Now they had come from local debates in Great Britain about the conflicts between Protestants and Catholics. The concepts they had were those of Christian freedom, tyranny of religious tyranny, which meant the Roman Catholic Church was considered a tyranny because it imposed human laws in religion, which you should never do. So all these notions were familiar to them. They have to um, start governing India, or Bengal initially. What do they draw upon? Well, there's 
centuries of European descriptions of India, or at least one century of European descriptions of India. But if we look at those, we see that they also draw on these debates that Christians had had with the Jews and Protestants had had with Roman Catholics. So when they begin to describe the religion of the Indians, first they see chaos and diversity, and then they try to order that. Which models do they use? Which concepts? Those that are available to them, that's all we can do. Dolphins can only use dolphin concepts to understand the world, so and we cannot have some Martian concepts, unfortunately. So they use those, and they begin to map things they see here onto their understanding of religion in Europe. For instance, the idea that there was one nation of heathens in India comes into being because they begin to see the diversity of groups as a variant of the Jews. The Jews were divided into tribes, which were then united into one nation under God because they had a kind of covenant, a contract with God, where God had told them, you have to worship me, follow the Ten Commandments, follow certain uh, practical rules, ceremonies in terms of food, bathing. So they said, all these groups here, they're one nation, they're tribes. First they call them tribes, later on castes. So it's very similar to Judaism. And there's the Brahmins. Well, these are the priests of this religion. Much like among the Jews, you had a tribe of priests. Of course, they're Protestants, so priesthood also means kind of comparison with the Roman Catholic priesthood. So Brahmins, what do they say, become these people who obsessively think that certain external ceremonies will please the gods who think they have some special privileges, which the Jewish priests also had, and the Roman Catholic priests, namely only they can worship God, really, uh, they, only they can read Sanskrit and the holy texts. So they begin to map what they find in India onto these debates that had taken place in Europe. Out of that comes the story that the secularists tell about India today. The colonial story, the European story about India, it's not that all Europeans told the same story. In fact, many of the early observers tell fascinating things, very insightful things about what they saw in India, very reflective. But then when this goes back to Europe and there's all kinds of debates, this gets digested into this kind of ordered standard picture of Hinduism and the caste system. Now that picture, at a very deep level, relies on how Christianity had understood Judaism and how Protestantism had understood Catholicism and Hinduism as a kind of variant of Judaism and Catholicism. I told you before, secularism had tremendous problems with certain forms of religion, namely religions that focused on, I mean, which they claimed were present in the public sphere, which followed certain laws and, and um, ceremonies, uh, which made people follow certain practices as though these were commanded by God. So everything that is not private faith and religion, basically everything that's not Protestantism, is problematic. Now, if they map Hinduism onto these two, onto how they had understood Catholicism and Judaism, they're going to have tremendous problems with Hinduism. And they did initially because they just thought it was false religion, it's worship of false gods where the Brahmin priests are cunning and evil and manipulate everyone. There's this clear hierarchy uh, which is imposed by the Brahmins much like the Roman Catholic Church had imposed the hierarchy. They follow all these material ceremonies much like the Jews, so false religion, very problematic, but initially they say we do have this principle of toleration where the state cannot interfere, so we'll allow them to live by their religion. And the missionaries try to reform and convert the Hindus. So this story crystallizes more and more. It is taught in schools in India, in the colonial education system, literally teaches this story about Indian culture in the same way that it teaches Newton's 
law of gravitation, and Darwin's evolutionary theory, Lavoisier's theory of combustion, and then there's India, Indian culture equals Hinduism and the caste system equals discrimination, uh, worship of many gods, all kinds of things. So they teach us that way. They have many Indian students, Indian administrators, who begin to speak in this way and act as though all of this makes sense to them. They have to in order to survive in this system. This goes on and on and on. We reach 1947, the entire nationalist movement has picked up this story about secularism and it shouldn't be a Hindu state, it should be a secular state. Nehru, Nehru literally says uh, it's either a secular state or a theocracy and a theocracy is like Pakistan or, or uh, some barbaric country, so India cannot be a Hindu state, it should be a secular state. What does he mean by that? Typical European kind of secular state where religion becomes private. So the judges, the politicians of today still speak that language, but the language does not make sense to them the way it makes sense to judges, politicians and lay people in India, uh, in Belgium or Europe rather. See, for me, Belgium is the center of Europe. It is, really. <laughs> it has many more things than chocolate and beer. Now, even though there is some problems are coming into being in Europe also, because this language, these ideas, these intuitions are not shared by everyone, and more and more Christianity, people no longer know how Christian their world is, the society in which they live is. They claim it's really secular. They no longer realize how Christian it is. But still, there are certain reasonable limits within which all these debates can be held. A, a constitutional court judge in Belgium cannot say, ah, oh, Catholics think that going to mass is essentially religious. Well, this is all material. According to me, this is not essentially religious, so the state can run churches, tell them when to have service and when not to have service. Unthinkable. In India, thinkable. Because these reasonable limits, the internal logic of all these ideas is absent. It's not there in the background. It's not there in the world people live in. Not even in Delhi, even though that's a kind of alien enclave in India. But not even there. This life world is there. It's one of the most beautiful words in Dutch. is leef wereld. Uh, in English, it doesn't sound good. Life world. It literally mean, I mean, means the world in which you live, which you experience. The background against which you live. What you take as self-evident. It means all these things. So we live in that kind of world, an experiential world. Judges in India, teachers in India, politicians in India, uh, university professors, PhD students, more and more the middle class youth. They have ways of talking which have no connection to their experiential world. They try to introduce what they think the practices or ways of going about that they think these ideas refer to. So by watching European TV series, or especially American TV series, some judges I can imagine by reading, say, judgments from the American Supreme Court, but they have no access to the world in which all these people live, where all these ideas and laws and principles and practices are embedded. They live in a completely different world, and there's this disconnect. So all the creativity, the reasonableness, the incredible knowledge that's been developed in this experiential world in India, that's still there, is disconnected from what they have to practice as teachers, as journalists, as judges, as uh, you name it, as lawyers. And that's what creates these problems. So what does that mean? I mean today we cannot just junk the secular state. It's there. We wouldn't know what to replace it with. You cannot go tomorrow and say, I declare India to be an unsecular state or a Hindu state. No one knows what that means for India to be a Hindu state. So it cannot just be replaced. But what we have to become aware of are its problems, its very fundamental problems. 
first of all, the description of Indian culture and society that it works with, the secular state, secular politicians, secularist intellectuals, is not knowledge. It's simply the way that Europeans experienced India, that got transformed as though it's some kind of scientific description. But it's not knowledge. It doesn't allow you to solve problems in Indian society. And when that's the case, we have to become aware of that, see where it goes wrong, see where there's misdiagnosis, because when you diagnose a disease in the wrong way, you say that someone has cancer and give them chemotherapy while they had a throat infection, well, you see what the consequences will be. And that's what's happening to a large extent today. So even though we cannot replace secular state by something else immediately, we have to find out what all these problems are and try to remedy them. We have to look at the experiences of conflict and coexistence in India. For instance, the violence between Hindus and Muslims in India is not religious conflict at all. It's called communalism. No one knows what that means exactly. But one thing is certain, secularism cannot provide a solution to these conflicts because they're not religious conflicts. What then are they? What kind of conflict are they? They're very different from the conflicts between Protestants and Catholics, Muslims and Christians, Muslims and Jews, Christians and Jews. There, these had some kind of shared structure. Hindu-Muslim conflict in India does not have that. So begin to reflect on the experience of conflict and coexistence in India. There are incredible, and it's something that people like to say, Hinduism is secularism, absolute nonsense as a statement, but what they want to refer to makes sense. And this culture has been able to harbor any number of traditions, practices, religions, you name it. And African slaves of the Portuguese escape from Goa, come to Karnataka, they just become another jati, the cities, uh, you just give them the, and they can become part of this kind of, uh, get a place in society. And that goes for all groups. We cannot just say that is our alternative to secularism. Like a Muslim girl reciting the Gita and winning some prize, that's not our alternative to secularism. It's beautiful. It shows that there are incredible practices of dealing with difference and diversity, but they do, cannot provide an alternative at this point. We have to start examining them, finding out how they could also lead to say, different political practices. Look at how kings and, and um, rulers dealt with these issues in the past, not because we want to go back. Unfortunately, you cannot go back in time to solve problems, I, except uh, Michael J. Fox, you know him, <laughs> back to the future actor. We cannot go back to find some ideal Hindu kingdom or Indian kingdom or whatever you want to, a Muslim kingdom and say, this is how it should be. No, we have to go forward. And that means working with the institutions that we have, trying to change them so that they, this connection comes into being between a society, it's Lebenswelt. So please learn that. In German, it's Lebenswelt, another beautiful word. word. So if there's one word you should learn from, German and Dutch, it's Lebenswelt and Lebenswelt. So that connection has to come into being. That means rethinking the institutions, rethinking the laws, rethinking the political ideas, rethinking education. And that's what has to happen now. Thank you.